Dr. Benowitz, why don't we just start with your motivation? What attracted you to this field? Um, a number of things. I um, was very fortunate to do a, uh, my PhD research in the lab of Roger Sperry at Caltech, um, subsequently won a Nobel Prize, but some of his work involved uh, regeneration of the optic nerve. And I think that was my first, that was my first introduction to the um, idea that at least in lower vertebrates, all of his work was in um, uh, amphibia and then people in his group work in fish as well, uh, where we saw that, that the uh, simpler vertebrates um, are able to regenerate the optic nerve, but of course mammals cannot. But the fact that any species can lends encouragement to the idea that uh, regeneration in principle might be possible. So um, later I became interested in the question of how uh, connections become modified in the brain. And it occurred to me that by studying the, uh, the proteins that are involved in the formation of new connections when nerve, when nerve fibers are uh, regenerating, perhaps I could give some insight into um, plasticity that occurs in the adult brain. I've, I remember reading a pretty in-depth article one time on regeneration in the spinal cord. And the big takeaway for me, this is probably about 10 or 12 years ago now, was that while there has been a lot of promise, it's hard to find a field where there's also as much disappointment and struggle. Have you found that to be the case as well? Um, the optic nerve turns out to be a great um, example of a central nervous system pathway um, which normally does not show any capacity to regenerate, but there have been breakthroughs in my lab and others uh, in getting it to regenerate. And part of the motivation for studying regeneration of the optic nerve is the hope that things that are learned in that system can be carried over to the spinal cord and other parts of the, uh, of the central nervous system. And uh, in fact, that has proven to be the case. So while none of these findings are yet in clinical practice, um, there have been discoveries um, that uh, have carried over um, to enable, at least in animal models, some degree of regeneration. But the spinal cord is a much more complex uh, system, of course, than the optic nerve, um, with many um, great, a great distance for axons to grow, um, many barriers to regeneration, uh, complex circuitry. But some of the basic principles that we are learning in the optic nerve um, turn out to be um, applicable to the spinal cord as well. All right, the barriers, I remember them talking about scar tissue in particular, uh, presenting a barrier. When it comes to the optic nerve, I have to admit reading over your most recent published research in October, I sat there a bit slack-jawed as it appears that you and your team have discovered the regulator, the switch, if you will, or at least a part of the retinal ganglion cell that can spark regeneration. If you could talk a little bit more about that, it just seems like that's a pretty big deal. Sure, happy to. So this is part of a long-term collaboration with colleagues at um, UCLA um, and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, we are all part of a research collaboration that was established by the Adelson Foundation, uh, the Adelson Family Foundation. And uh, while well, Mr. Adelson of course, was, was alive uh, back in 2005, and this has proven to be an enormously successful um, consortium of, uh, of investigators who have pooled their knowledge and, um, and skills uh, together to try to um, advance knowledge beyond what any of us could do in isolation. And it's been very successful that way. So what we did in, in that, the study that you're referring to is to um, look at the genes that get switched on. In other words, the, the portions of the genetic code uh, that get switched on when nerve cells, retinal ganglion cells, that is the, the neurons in the eye that send their axons through the optic nerve, that's the retinal ganglion cells. Uh, what we investigated was uh, the question of what are the genes uh, that get switched on when we're able to promote regeneration using a cocktail of um, treatments that were developed in our lab and, and, and others. Uh, and so with this cocktail, we were able to get a substantial amount of regeneration. 
and then using um, methods of analyzing the um, messenger RNAs that are present in the cell, in other words, a reflection of which parts of the DNA are becoming transcribed, uh, we, uh, again, now with the colleagues at UCLA, Drs. Dan Geshwin, Riki Kawaguchi, and uh, um, at the time, um, Giovanni Coppola, we uh, studied, we, we, we were able to determine the genes that get turned on during regeneration. And then using um, computational methods, bioinformatics, um, that team was able to look at the upstream regions of those genes that get switched on. Those are the regions of the gene where um, what, what are called transcription factors. Those are proteins that bind to the DNA and determine um, whether a, a gene will be read out or not. Uh, and so by bioinformatics, because there's so much information now available in data banks, um, we were able to predict what are the transcription factors that are responsible for switching on the regeneration program. And from that, we um, found the kind of number one candidate. Um, we, there are candidates both for switching on genes and there are candidates that repress a regenerative program under normal circumstances. And so by removing that predicted repressor of gene expression, we were able to get substantial levels of, of regeneration. I should mention another interesting aspect of that study is that we also worked in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jeff Goldberg, who's the chairman of uh, ophthalmology at Stanford. And uh, uh, Jeff's lab contributed a complementary piece of data which was to look at what happens when retinal ganglion cells are normally developing. So as the nervous system is developing, the cells in the retina extend axons back into the brain, and they do this very successfully and very vigorously. Then they lose that capacity. So that the complementary question to what we did, to what we studied in regeneration, is the question of um, what, what transcription factors enable nerve cells to rapidly grow their connections during development. And the remarkable finding is that the comparison between developing retinal ganglion cells and regenerating retinal ganglion cells turned up the very, very same transcription factors. So we were very excited about that. And this, uh, this one transcription factor that was featured in that paper um, was in both cases turned out to be a major repressor of the regenerative program. So during development, that repressor comes into play and shuts off the growth program, whereas in regeneration, that repressor is inactivated and enables uh, the cells to grow axons. So what stands out to me as a total layman, what is remarkable about this is often a research project will perhaps, if they're lucky, conclude one thing. But I'm hearing three things. One, pinpointing the part of the gene that regulates a lot of this, figuring out how to switch it on or off, and then to actually grow, regenerate part of the axon here. Am I, am I wrong here? It just seems like a lot was done. No, that's right. We were very, uh, we were very excited about all of this. The first stage is the, uh, the um, obtaining the gene expression profile from these cells, both during development and during regeneration, compared to the state when they're not growing. Um, and by looking at the genes that are differentially expressed, then predicting what the master regulators are that control turning on or turning off that regenerative program. And then, you know, the proof of the pudding is testing these transcription factors and seeing that, lo and behold, it actually works. Uh, we're able to, um, you know, just by manipulating this one particular transcription factor, get a substantial amount of regeneration. It's not the whole thing. It's not the whole program, but it's a very substantial part of it. And carrying this work further, um, one would hope that we could um, continue the uh, analysis of what the uh, regulators are in the hope that you know, that, that just a small number of these regulatory molecules might account for the full-blown program that a cell has to switch into in order to uh, regrow its connections. Do you foresee, Do you foresee treatment, treatment coming, coming from, from something, something like, like this? this? Well, um, 
That's the hope, of course. Um, I should say that uh, work from um, our lab and others um, have pointed to a number of ways to get retinal ganglion cells to regenerate axons for considerable distances. Now, all the way down the full length of the optic nerve in animal models and into the, uh, the relay areas of the brain that then um, relay these signals up to the cortex and to other uh, centers for, for higher level processing or for visually guided behaviors. Um, so that's a little bit, and it's, it's a, um, a glimmer of hope, but we're still pretty far from having uh, sufficient regeneration to support what, you know, what any of us would recognize as uh, substantial levels of vision. So some of the barriers are that when the visual system is forming, there are very uh, precise signals that enable the nerve cells in the retina to connect to the very uh, appropriate centers in the brain. Uh, so these are called guidance molecules. And then in order for the visual world to be mapped onto the brain, <clears throat> excuse me, to be mapped onto the brain in an orderly fashion, the, the near neighbor relationships in the retina, like this cell is right next to this cell, right next to this cell, those, those cells connections have to then go and project in an orderly fashion onto the brain. So that is the, the mapping issue. And some really exciting research in the neurosciences going back 20, 25 years, identified some of the principal molecules that enable these maps of the visual world and, and uh, other properties to, to form on the brain, in the brain, throughout the nervous system. So we don't know if, whether that can be recapitulated yet during development, whether targeting to the right projection areas that we, th we think can happen, but the formation of a, uh, an accurate map of the visual world is, is, is the next, kind of the next frontier, uh, another challenge, big challenge. I'm going to ask I'm going you to ask take, you your, take crystal your crystal ball, ball out, though, though, and when you say it'll, it'll take, some, take time. some time, what, what is the time, is the time frame, frame, frame your best your guess? guess? Well, I would say maybe 10 years we'll have satisfactory levels of regeneration um, if we don't discover other um, insuperable barriers. Um, I should also mention, though, um, your, your uh, listeners may be interested in hearing other approaches that are looking very promising. So my work has been focused um, pretty exclusively on this issue of regenerating the pathway the connections from the retina back to the brain. But other methods of restoring vision to the blind include the use of um, uh, the use of assistive devices that capture uh, the image of the outside world, transform this into a series of um, electronic signals that either get uh, projected back into the brain. Um, that work is, um, is, it's a very active field the level of uh, visual uh, resolution, the precision of the, of the visual image is still very low, but at least there's a, an indication that that might be feasible to restore at least some level of vision. Another advance along those lines came from, um, from Dr. Jose Sahel and his group uh, in Paris, now at Pittsburgh and collaborators uh, elsewhere, including Botan Raska uh, in Switzerland. Uh, so a very exciting paper from that group, I think is now two years old, um, showed that in, in, the case of, uh, in the case where the photoreceptors, not the retinal ganglion cells, but in cases where the photoreceptors degenerate, which is, which is um, a fairly common occurrence, fairly common uh, source of visual loss, what happens there is that the photoreceptors um, send um, signals back up through the other cells of the retina through a very complex network of cells um, up to the retinal ganglion cells, the cells we study, which are the final integrators of information, visual information in the retina. Those are the cells that then send signals back to the brain, to the rest of the brain. And um, what this very exciting paper uh, from the Sahel group and Roska group showed is that um, even though the photoreceptors are gone, you could put um, uh, genes into the retinal ganglion cells uh, 
using um, gene transfer, virally mediated gene transfer, to now make the retinal ganglion cells sensitive to light signals. Then through the use of a, um, an electronic device and, and uh, goggles, feed an image of the visual world directly onto the retina to activate that, um, that protein in the retinal ganglion cells. That protein, activation of that protein by light, then activates the retinal ganglion cells. And that allows a signal to be sent back to the brain. So studies that were published from uh, that group in, uh, in Paris um, show that people can, who had been blind for years, uh, can start to um, identify objects or at least reach for objects um, in front of them. That's so, and, I'm sorry, go ahead, I apologize. Um, well, I was just gonna mention one other area and that is the use of um, stem cells um, in order to replace the lost retinal ganglion cells. So there too, there are uh, several groups um, in the forefront of that. Uh, Dr. Goldberg is one, Don Zach in uh, Hopkins is another, Tom Ray uh, in Seattle is another. I'm probably leaving out a lot of very important research. Um, and they're working to um, get stem cells to adopt the identity of retinal ganglion cells, put those into the retina, and um, see if they will acquire the properties of retinal ganglion cells and form appropriate connections back to the brain. So these other areas are all still very much works in progress. But um, I'd say putting all these methods together, things are looking you know, far more hopeful than they did 10 years ago. It, it really is remarkable. And at the end of the day, and I'll end with this, at the end of the day, we're talking about life-changing, potentially life-changing yeah. treatment for people. We had Officer Wright here who, in the course of his job, lost complete eyesight. And the fact that within his lifetime, he may be able to see something again to me is just extraordinary. Yeah, well, you know, vision is the the sense that we most use to interact with the outside world. So, um, if this were to succeed, you're right; it, it could be life changing. Yeah. Anything else that you'd like to add, Dr. Benowitz, that I might have missed? Um, well, I think I um, I tried to cover uh, work outside um, my own labs. Um, as I say, there as I said, there uh, are other groups, uh, very prominent groups. Um, who've made major uh, breakthroughs in this area of um, regeneration of the uh, nerve fibers and the optic nerve. My, my neighbor at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, Jigong He, is, um, is uh, in the front, forefront of this field. Uh, Jeff Goldberg works in this area, a number of other groups do. And um, fortunately, we've reached the stage where we're coming out of our silos and collaborating heavily. So um, this makes, this makes all the difference in the world um, so that the, uh, um, the, the work is synergistic and the effects of the treatments are synergistic.